Hey folks, welcome to a beautiful day in the canyons with a awesome beautiful car. Awesome, awesome car. Uh, the Aston Martin DBX 707. And you might think it makes 707 horsepower. It only does if you're in Europe. Right. In America, 697 707 horsepower. PS, right? 707 PS. Yes. Which it means... Uh, Penny starting? That doesn't make any sense. It means push starting. <laughs> um, in this video, we will answer a couple of key questions about Aston Martin's superest SUV. Uh, is there a point to this thing? Right. <laughs> Should you spend the extra fifty to a hundred thousand dollars on the seven oh seven if you are interested in a DBX at all? And uh, how does it compare to the Oris as well as to the Bentley Bentayga. Folks, you know, when times get tough, it can be really hard to figure out where to turn. And something that's always worked really well for me is therapy. Talk therapy. Not necessarily taking psychotropic substances, but talking it out with a therapist on a regular schedule. But not only is there a stigma around seeing therapists, although admittedly less so than there used to be, but if for young men, it's still a tough thing to decide to go to therapy. Once you do, though, Honestly, the change is pretty radical, and I should know I've been seeing a therapist for more than half my life, 20 years at this point. But where do you start? That can be really a challenge, and therapists, especially since the COVID pandemic, have been overwhelmed. They're not taking new patients. It can be very, very tough, but that's why BetterHelp is sponsoring today's video. They offer over 20,000 licensed therapists that can talk with you over a secure phone, video, or even a text connection, right? They're available around the clock. They're there to help you on your schedule. Maybe you travel a lot. Maybe you have an irregular work schedule. Maybe you've got school or kids and it's tough to find the exact same regular occurrence or go see a therapist in person. BetterHelp can help with all of that, right? You can talk on a regular schedule with someone virtually on video chat or phone sessions over a secure connection so you know that your privacy is assured. And then you can message your therapist anytime you feel the need in between those sessions. Now, of those 20,000 plus therapists that BetterHelp has, you may not find the one that works best for you, the style you like, the personality you relate to right away, although they do have a system to optimize this. And if that happens, you can change therapists at any time. There's no no additional cost and no additional headaches. So join the 3 million plus people who have found their way into therapy and taken charge of their mental health with BetterHelp. Go to betterhelp.com slash the smoking tire and get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. The link is in the description and thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. These are important questions, but first the boilerplate items. Uh, the DBX does not share a platform with other uh, cars. It's not a tarted up Volkswagen. It's not a golf, right. right? Yeah. No MQB. No, it's not. Yeah, there you can't buy uh, a Toyota version of this platform, or, right. or whatever. But it does share an engine and a gearbox with AMG. With many uh, AMG products. Right. AMG products. Four liter twin turbo V8 hot V design uh, from AMG. 697 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 663 torques at 4,500 RPM. Uh, it weighs 5,128 pounds. The regular DBX has a nine-speed automatic transmission with a torque converter. The 707 gets AMG's nine-speed automatic with the wet clutch design, which makes a massive difference in how it drives. Yes. Uh, you get 16 and a half inch ceramic front brakes, 15 and a half inch rear. Whereas the regular DBX brakes. was just iron brakes, Correct. steel brakes, and these go, they went Correct. to ceramic. Which on top of being more effective, it saves 88 pounds of unsprung weight. That is huge. Right. Zero to 60, as tested by car and driver, 3.1 seconds and the quarter mile in 11.5 at 119 <laughs> miles an hour. Braking 70 to zero is 151 feet, which okay. is very impressive for a 5,100 pound vehicle, although it does trail the Aorus by two feet. 
Two feet is not a two huge feet. amount of distance unless you hit something and then travel two more feet. Right. <laughs> if you hit something and you travel one more foot, you're like, oh, so close. Right. Very close. Uh, it'll do 0.94G on the skid pad, which is excellent, but the RS will do 1.02G on the skid pad. It's wider and lower and has bigger, fattier Huge, uh, huge meats on that thing. Right. And it says Lamborghini, so, right. you know. Having said that, 5347 weight distribution. It has a 27% larger Billy Bass mouth than the regular DBS right, for better which cooling. Pulls in 80% more air. And right. they also added two new heat exchangers on either side of the radiator to help cool this kind of hotter engine. Right. It's got 48 volt mild hybrid anti roll control, which is neat. Uh, it's got a shorter final drive ratio than the regular DBX for better acceleration. And it has what I call car show mode, which in theory, you hold either paddle down while starting it, and it gives you an extra loud start. Really? That's what I read. Paddle, start button. Holding left paddle, holding start button. I don't, I don't know if I could tell the difference. I don't know if I could tell the difference. If I hit the exhaust button, that's louder. The exhaust louder. button makes it louder, yeah. That That's the louder version. That's the loud mode. Uh, I don't... I don't know. Uh, well, it's right. better that than the other way around. Well, we should also say that this is a prototype vehicle, pre-production, so it's possible. Says it on the window. I mean, yeah, in two places. So it is possible that that function works on the production cars, and maybe, maybe this doesn't have it. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, we were given the heads up by Aston Martin. Hand-built pre-production prototype. Some features may be unavailable, as well as certain things may not work properly, yes. such as... Some features may become unavailable, we've discovered. Well, that too, but like, for instance, if, you, if I hit the button to turn off uh, auto stop start, that function works, but the little light on the button doesn't come on. So let's just... Uh, it's on. Is it? No, no, it's so dim. It's oh. so incredibly wow, dim. Wow, it is on, but you're right. It's on, but it is crazy dim. But other lights yeah. are brighter. Like, I could see the one on lane departure. Anyway, yeah. um, so try the thing. I've had this car for a week. I've loved it. It's been amazing. It's done everything really, really well. But then Zach got in it this morning, and he broke it. Um, <laughs> I drove up here on the highway. Everything was working wonderfully. And I parked. I waited for you because uh, I got here ahead of you because I won. I was faster. And then when I went to start the car again, I was no longer allowed to select any drive modes. The function doesn't work at all. It's not. And I've, we've tried turning it off and on, locking the car. Yeah. I went into the vehicle system where, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, where you customize individual mode and like messed with that, but that doesn't activate the central knob that changes you from GT mode, which is comfort, to sport or sport plus, and as well as the adjustable shock button, neither of them work now. So. We are stuck which in is a GT bummer. mode. We are stuck in GT which mode. Which is deeply unfortunate because the other drive modes are distinctive and work, and we can't get to them. The good news is, it's obviously still very quick. And it will let GT you mode. use the paddles, but it will cancel them if you don't shift it often enough like if you yeah it'll put it in manual with the paddles but it'll go back to auto after 20 seconds or so so, I'm so in you third better right keep now. shifting yeah otherwise <laughs> it jumps to ninth yeah. like really really quickly yeah the wet clutch gearbox can skip shift so something i noticed right away in this is that the steering is i'd say uh top shelf as far as super suvs go because mm. some of them they add way too much weight to try to do an impression of feedback. Yeah. Um, or they're like a little bit too light. But this has a really good weight to it. It's it's not quite as like sharp and in tune as the Cayenne uh, GT Turbo we drove. Right. But it's like, it's real close to there. Like I like the way this feels. It feels pretty honest and authentic. If I wanted like straight up the fastest you know, Canyon SUV, I'd probably get that Cayenne Turbo GT. I agree. Uh, because it's basically as quick as the Urus, but a hundred grand less. Yeah. But what I do love about this is it, A, it, it extends Aston Martin's sports car aesthetic to the SUV segment, probably better than anyone else. Like, 
the Lamborghini beak that works on the Aventador mm-hmm. doesn't really work so well on the Urus. And if I had an Urus, and I, I really do enjoy driving the Urus, and I saw an RSQ8 on the road that basically drives exactly the same for half the money, I'd be mildly frustrated. Right, because it looks like you could almost take the, the front clip off yeah. of the Urus and put it on the RSQ8. When you see, yeah, when you see an RSQ8 and an Urus next to each other, there are an awful lot of similarities. There are. This is obviously very distinctive. I think the profile's great. I really like the rear three-quarter look as well. I think they integrated that classic Aston Martin spoiler in a, in a really nice way. The front, you know, after reading about how much more air they needed to push through, I understand why the mouth looks a lot bigger than it did on the last DBX we had. Because right. when this showed up, I was like, something's different. Like, why, why is this mouth so big? But it's they just needed 80% the ma- more the mouth air. mouth looks like someone's at the dentist and has one of those spreaders in their face <laughs> to get braces put yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I'm trying to answer questions. Acceleration is obviously really, really good, and the brakes it's do so a great fast. job. The brakes do a really good job. So with without uh, having the Sport and Sport Plus modes, a couple of things they did to make this different from the regular DBX, they actually stiffened the front end by 9%. They added some new cross-member pieces and some reinforcements. And one of the things they did I thought was really interesting is on the GT mode, they turned off the active anti-roll bar system. They also like retune the suspension, some other things, but they turned off that system that makes it really firm so that you get the floaty ride and the comfort. And then when you put, put it into sport modes, that's when you get the 48 volt active anti-roll bar that like locks it down and has basically allowed so many really heavy sport SUVs to feel like they corner really flat. Yeah, my preferred mode, which we're not going to get today because the cars disagreed with us, is in the individual setting, which allows you to dial in your specific parameters. I like soft suspension, sport steering, sport plus powertrain, and mega obnoxious loud mode. Yes. So that gives you that real supercar, tight locking clutch, sharp throttle response, selecting the right gear, but also a really good ride. This this may be the best riding car on 23s that I've been in. Have you? Does the new Range Rover have 23s? Uh, the one I drove, I think, had 22s. Yeah. And I think this manages, I would say these ride, they ride equally well, especially over little cracks on the highway. Yeah. I could feel them through the, the seat of this car as I could in the Range Rover. So it's just, I think that's just a, a problem with tires that are that thin and wheels that are yeah. that big. Yeah, 35 front, 30 rear series Pirelli P0s on this thing. So not a lot of rubber. I mean, it's a lot wide, but yeah. not a lot of sidewall right. uh, to work with there. And the fact that this rides as well as it does with a 35 and a 30 series sidewall is really impressive. And I think the tuning they've done with these active Bilsteins is nice like going through the corners even in gt mode it, it feels like it's really planted but it's not getting shuffled around when we go over little bumps and stuff like that yeah. like all of the tuning they've done I, I think is noticeable i'm gonna find a place to turn around so that you can drive i will I say it's my turn even in gt mode when you're flat this thing upshifts really quick yeah i mean the modes kind of go out the window when your foot is on the floorboard yes you know if if, if you floored it the car knows Okay, just give me get me whatever as fast as right. possible. Because when you're when on the way up here, I had it in Sport Plus, and I was maybe at like I don't know fifty percent throttle, and the shifts were actually a little bit lazy. It was mm. pull paddle, wait second, then shift. It wasn't like immediate, um, but full when you're at right full here. throttle, it does the job. What the, the like the one of the biggest differences with this wet clutch gearbox is how it downshifts it's it doesn't drag like the torque converter does whenever you downshift the torque converter gearbox it kind of drags the gear Mm -hmm. whereas the wet clutch gearbox it snaps the gear you can feel something opening and closing it's a more immediate engagement yeah absolutely can i just say how much i hate button push button on the dashboard i don't mind it except drive is drive drive is really far away i don't like that's really strange 
You have a big reach to drive. I need I need a carbon fiber stick for five hundred dollars <laughs> to poke it. When you get in this, like I know it's a, it's an Aston Martin thing. Their materials are exceptional. Like the leather in these, it it actually feels like it's the kind of leather that you'd get to have like a handbag made out of or something. It's the it's really thick and really rich dyes. And oftentimes when it's when they talk about it being, you know, handmade, it, it what that means is the the materials are great and the assembly is inconsistent. Yeah, I mean some of the stitching will wander a right. little bit. This is the first Aston I've driven maybe ever where it feels like you you get that with the materials. The materials are thick and rich, but it's actually screwed together as well as a German car. Uh, yeah. This one I would this agree. is this Despite this little software issue we're having now and not being able to use this knob, which very much sucks, the, the build quality on this thing is stellar. It is very good. And this has 7,700 miles on it, and yeah. this is a prototype car. Yeah. I know that's not a lot of miles to most car owners, but no, for, but a, for a hand prototype journalist car. Let's see. Can I launch it? Let's if there see. were going to be wiggles, there would be wiggles. Nope. Nope. That's not a launch. Yeah, I think you have to have, like, traction off. But, but look, still, man, <laughs> it still goes. So without the launch, you know, instead of instead of three one, that was probably three five. Oh God, who has that kind of time? I like the big paddles fixed to the column. They're dry carbon, so they feel really nice in your hand. The weight distribution, like it feels so like neutral. It gives you, uh, it, it gives you pretty, it'll, uh, sorry, not it gives you, it lets you be pretty aggressive with the downshifts. It will allow you to downshift even when the resulting gear is very close to redline. I really like that. That's excellent. I mean, that's something that we, other cars get wrong even when they're in their sportiest mode. Yeah. We're in regular We're in GT, GT mode, mode and it still, still lets you do that. It does sound like an AMG. It's not, yeah, you know, but, but it's not a bad sound, you know. No, it's not a bad sound. It's got a good snarl. It's not as obnoxious as a F Pace SVR or Range Rover SVR. Right, that causes earthquakes. Yeah, those are real loud. But it's got a really nice tone. I mean, the agility of this is excellent. It's really surprising, like what has been done these days with these kind of super SUVs. But this, this, and the Maserati Levante and the Cayenne are like it's so impressive what they make 5,400, 5,600 pounds do. I mean, you can like, like right there, you tap the brake a little bit. And it sets, as it sets, it adds a little bit more negative camber and it just like tucks in. Yeah. It's not, and it's not as aggressive as that, that Cayenne had like two and a half degrees of negative. Remember, you're sitting still. Yeah, the Cayenne the outside only had the tires dirt weren't the, touching yeah. dirt. Yeah, it, only it was dirt so aggressive and it was almost a little twitchy. It was more fun. It was definitely the more track oriented SUV. But this is like a really nice Goldilocks, you know, temperature as far as uh, the eagerness goes. I am I am a huge fan of this thing. I really, I really am, and it's got massive curb appeal. As I drove it around uh, LA, you know, people immediately saw it as being different from the regular DBX. I got stopped a lot. Um, I didn't ask for any special treatment, but it got parked up front at the valet uh, at a nice restaurant. The, uh, a lot of people at gas stations were asking me about it, and it just, it had a bunch more presence than the regular DBX, but it also was such a nice thing to just use in the city. I, uh, I moved cardboard boxes. I've, I've been moving. If you listen to the podcast, you might have heard me talk about it. I moved into my new house, and I used this thing to, to help move. It's got the hatch. It is uh, a yeah. lot more usable than uh, you know a DBS in that regard. I mean, it's it's high up, and it's you know it is bigger than a sports car should be. I wouldn't necessarily consider buying this instead of a sports car, but 
it's really, really got chops. Yeah. And even though I liked the regular DBX, I thought that was a pretty decent package. This shows me that those guys are, are really getting serious. When I went to Hypercar Invitational and I talked to uh, North American CEO Adam Chamberlain, he kept saying over and over, I can't wait for you to get in an S707. I can't wow. wait. It's totally different. It's totally awesome. The gearbox makes all the difference in the world. The new suspension stuff, the new brakes. He's like, it's so much more lively and, and fun. And he is not wrong. And it's and it shows that the foundation of the DBX that they do make is good. And they but they added you know clever hardware in the brakes, uh, the bracing, and then the retuning. Like it's just a, it's like a couple new instruments, a little bit of better uh, conducting, and like and the whole thing is elevated to a new level. And zero to sixty in three one when you're doing <laughs> fifty one hundred pounds and with gasoline. You know, I realized that Lucid and and Plaid, you know, are that kind of weight and they're doing, you know, twos, but that's electric. That's a different type of power delivery. With gasoline, that becomes really challenging. That is a really really impressive time. I don't want to say it's not challenging for electric. It's still challenging, but but obviously as we've learned over the last 10 years, electric Super sedans are dragsters. That's what they do. Right. Whereas this is a different type of thing, and it still manages to be very, very successful um, as kind of a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. I mean, this can be a one-car solution for somebody. So to answer our questions, where did I put my notebook? It went down here. Should you buy this if you're considering a dbx at all should you spend the money for 707 i think yes absolutely i mean it's a what is a forty thousand dollar premium until you dip into like really custom paint and stuff yeah. like that so uh, yeah it, it drives the way you'd want a car to drive without compromising too much of the comfort right the two hundred and forty thousand dollar base a lot of money this one's 293 but it's got all kinds of stuff on it the two-tone contrast stitch leather the matte paint the 23 inch wheels i mean they've done it up nice yeah and with aston martin one thing that's great is every car is built to how you want it so you can do crazy colors you can do all kinds of luxurious options, um, but that's the range, and I think it, it is worth it. If you're going to go for the DBX, get to that 707 because dynamically it is superior. Is there a point to this thing? Uh, I, I mean, yeah. If, if there are, we crossovers have proven that people want a car that's taller, right? Like we can't, we can no longer say that this is a dumb idea. I mean, you can say the sports car would be better, but this is what people want. And there are people that want the Bentega, which is like the ultimate in high-rise luxury that moves around. But this is a has, I think, similar brand cachet and curb appeal, but it's more fun to drive and I think better looking. I think there is a point to it because if you're going to spend this much money, there, and it's not necessarily what I would do because I think over a, over a certain price value, you have kind of diminishing returns when it comes to crossovers versus sports cars. But that's just me. If I'm the, if I'm the customer, if this is consumer advice, I can see how if you're going to spend this much money, maybe you'd want to spend this much money on something that you can use every day and really get your money's worth, experience it every day, all the time, versus something that has limited use case because it only has two seats. Meaning like a DBS or, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because right. it has a smaller trunk or whatever. Like, I've been driving an Aston Martin to move. Right. <laughs> you know, and so uh, if I had to take carry a family around, like, do I want to do it in an Aston Martin versus do it in a BMW ver and then have an Aston Martin for only when I'm by myself? Yeah. You know, so yeah. I see the argument that, like, you, this feels like an Aston Martin. Exa yeah, And absolutely. so getting to use it for everything you need a car for makes some sense. Now, versus Urus versus Bentega. I mean, the Urus has a little bit more presence. And the interior on the Urus, I think, looks more Lamborghini. Even though there's a lot of Audi in it, I also think that the Audi gauge cluster, Urus, Audi, whatever, looks more expensive, looks sharper, has better graphics, etc. This is pretty simple. So... 
in that regard, it's like, ooh, Urus. But from the outside, I would go DBX. So to me, I think the DBX ha- is prettier mm-hmm. uh, than either the Bentega or the Urus. Oh, yeah. In the ways the Urus is actually quicker, they don't really matter to me in this category of car. Um, I've had an Urus on a racetrack. It is fun. But I wouldn't. That's not what I would do if I had an Urus. What What I do appreciate about this versus either Urus or Bentega is this is not a platform shared vehicle. Mm. You are you have a you have a vehicle that's not a more expensive version of a cheaper vehicle, and you can't approximate this for less money. Yeah, I you could get that. a Q eight, and you are a lot of the way to an Urus experience. Absolutely, and and I think that there would be parts inside the Urus that would bother me because I would notice the sharing. But I think objectively, some of the electronics. I just basically yeah. want to point out a negative about the DBX. Like they are better. I have some negatives. The lack of a touchscreen. Why? We, have, we it's 2022, and we still have to control CarPlay with this knob. They should probably figure out a touchscreen. Yes. Uh, the the hatch, the trunk hatch, doesn't open high enough, and I smash my head on it. As do regularly. I, and if you leave it parked for a while, it settles into the easy entry exit height, yeah. and it makes it even lower. Right. So yeah, double problem. Right. Uh, the ch- wireless charging pad is way down here. It exists, but it is very awkward to get your phone in and out of. Uh, and then, like we said before, you have to reach really far to put it in drive. Yeah. That's a, That drive is the farthest away button, and that's odd. I just... I just don't understand this thing. And also, I don't like, and this is more of a comment on Aston in general, this feels like a bowl of buttons to me. A bowl of like, buttons. Like, you've got, like, this button, I thought, this this looks like a power button. I thought this might turn on the drive mode yeah. activator, because some cars have that, right? Like McLaren. But here, turns it turns the off the stereo. Yeah. And But it's next to the loud exhaust, and yeah. then it's across from the shocks. Like, it's just a little bit too cluttered in here, and like you said, a touchscreen would get rid of yeah. two of these giant things. Yeah. Uh, all fair points. Despite that, God, did I love this thing for the week. I thought this was this the nicest place to roll around the city and spend my time and drive my friends around and haul stuff. And I parked it in my driveway and people wanted to come talk to me about it. And I really found it to be a charming uh, yet very functional uh, crossover mm-hmm. in a sea of a lot of sameness. So um, thank you to Aston for letting us borrow it for a week. We're sorry that the, um, the the mode thing has stopped working. I imagine that has to do with prototypeness, and and when you buy a production one, the drive mode selector will probably work okay. Uh, thanks to you guys for watching, and we will see you later. End slate. And remember, always fight your tickets. Use code TST10 on the Off the Record app available in the Android and iOS store or go to offtherecord.com/tst.